It's an old superstition amongst Navy SEALs that your last mission is the unluckiest. I believe it. When I reread the following excerpts from my journal, it is evident the completion of my most lucrative but bloodiest outing was uncanny. I have changed all the names. Most of you will refuse to believe my story. I know what happened, and I need to share my story. I was digging a grave. The Sierra Nevada mountain range stretched on for endless miles in front of me. Creosote and sage brush scents dried my nose as a tall shadow appeared over the hole I'd dug. The unknown man had a gun in his left hand, but it was not pointed at me yet. Marine Corps, Sergeant Lawson, the stranger said. I'm Navy SEAL Commander Joseph Card. Pleased to meet you. I dropped my shovel and squinted upwards. A special warfare insignia SEAL trident pin glimmered on the lapel of Card's shirt. I wondered if I could disarm him. It was a tactical disadvantage that he was above ground while I was six feet under. There was no way of reversing roles in the fight, and I did not have intentions of making that ditch my place of burial. Not my name, I said. I resumed my work and tightened the grip on the handle and dug the end of the shovel into the earth. I know it is, he said. You're the only one with that ink job. The tattoo he had referred to was on my right bicep, and it read Saint, a dead sinner, revised and edited. If you'll excuse me, I said, I have more holes to dig. People around here have to bury their loved ones. Tomorrow's a busy day for the cemetery. I need your service. I know your kill count. You've helped this country. They used to call you the spreader of death. I threw the shovel into the wall of muck and looked up at him while wiping sweat off my forehead. I'm out of the service, I said. If I wanted to go on another mission, I would have re-enlisted. This isn't for the government. I'm offering you a chance to do something good and make a fortune at the same time. Are you interested? No. You're wasting talent. You were born to save people and stop threats. This type of work is honorable, I said as I pointed at the shovel. It's practical. I don't kill. I honor the dead now. It's grueling, thankless, and doesn't pay. Come with me. Time is finite. Card bent down and extended his hand to help out. No, I said. I grabbed the handle again and proceeded to dig. Card raised the gun. It was a tranquilizer device. I had seen the design before in Afghanistan. The barrel had a syringe spring out from the end of it, along with a burst of brightness. A stinging sensation swelled on my neck. Dizziness overcame my vision as my eyelids grew heavy. I picked up the shovel and threw it at Card before he dodged it. You'll thank me in four hours, he said. Blackness covered the sky and swallowed my world. I woke up in a chair. Fatigue enveloped my body. My sight became clearer and I looked around. I was in front of a wooden table. Monochrome walls with expansive windows overlooked grassy plains. A wide theater-sized screen was at the end of the air-conditioned room. Card moved towards where I sat and handed me a jug of blue Gatorade. I nodded at him in thanks, much too tired to show the malice I felt, and took a long gulp. Don't try to fight once you're hydrated, Card said. I didn't want to sedate you, but time is running out. Sit back and listen to the mission details. Remember, I'm trying to help you get rich. Where am I? Westover Hills, an older-sounding man said. Texas. I stared in the direction of the echoing and unfamiliar voice. It originated from an individual in a suit and tie who sat at the end of the slab. A diamond-studded watch was on his wrist, and he had a mop of slick back gray hair. There were four other men around the table. They wore casual dress shirts and pants. Their tattoos and demeanors gave them away as blue-collar veterans. I could tell some were also not brought there by choice. My name is Howard LaSalle, the man said as he stood up and walked near the forefront of the table. 
I know you've all had run-ins with Mr. Card, so I'll skip his introduction. The four of us licked each other. The Howard LaSalle from Forbes, one of the grunts said. The billionaire Howard LaSalle. That's me. Pay attention to what Card has to say. Card cleared his throat while he stood in front of the screen, a remote control in his hand. Welcome, the seal said. Everyone, meet our newest guest, Keith Lawson. He's a valiant Marine Corps sergeant. He's been on special operations in Afghanistan. He was part of Enduring Freedom, another classified mission. I never took compliments well. I nodded at the group around the table. Also, meet Joso Morales, an Army Ranger enlisted for many years. He hunted Noriega in the jungles of Panama as part of Operation Just Cause. Morales nodded. He looked younger than his actual age, but his stare reflected his time on the front lines. Meet Anthony Dryden, someone who's done work as a TF for years and has been a combat rescue officer in the Air Force. Dryden wore a black and white Jack Daniels ball cap. He pulled out a can of wintergreen tobacco chew and placed the dip in the side of his mouth. Meet Matthew Hain. Hain began his military career as an EOD. He became a member of DevGru. He has participated in acts of counterterrorism. Hain had the look in his eyes of someone who wanted to get on with the details. Mr. LaSalle's daughter's kidnapped in Mexico, Card said. Her name is Victoria. She is a popular YouTube blogger. Vlogger, LaSalle said with a V. Right, Card said. Her boyfriend Robert Lucas tagged along with her on their trip. Their goal was to film various locales down there. They were what the youth call urbex filmmakers. They were searching for an abandoned temple. According to lore, it is a place where the dead get rehydrated and fed to snakes thirsty for blood. It's known in legend as the Temple of the Pucian, a place of ancient artifacts and dangerous creatures. I don't think it exists, but they did. During their search, they bribed tourist guides to try and get to it. They ran into some low people called Antrelossi scorpions. This translates to Along the Scorpions. They are one of the most vicious cartels in that region. This is their emblem. Card clicked a button on the device. The screen lit up behind him with an image of a gold ring resting on the back of a scorpion with a razor-sharp stinger. Card clicked the device again, and a picture of a woman holding an old Key 47 came up. She had hair black as a well of ink. She wore a sand-colored bulletproof vest with another weapon slung over her shoulder. Their leader earned the nickname Devorador de Almas, the Soul Devourer, pictured here. Her real name is Olesia Baccarin. We have confirmed Lucas is dead. They are threatening to end Victoria's life. They told Mr. Lasalle they would return his daughter for a price. They now want three billion dollars. I have a lot of money, Lasalle said while his eyes darkened, but not that amount. So you all are the help chosen to retrieve her. I picked each one of you for a very specific purpose. I went down to Exochemico alone before deciding a trained team was necessary. I discovered film in a cave Lucas hid in before capture. Card turned around and began playing the found footage. Victoria and Robert laughed in the first scene. They walked down the lanes of Mercado Merced in Mercado Sonora. They went into street markets in Mexico between rows of flea shop stands. They went into an occult bazaar with mason jars, voodoo dolls, spirit boards, and candles. A man wearing robes and rings on an every finger gazed up at them as they entered. Where can we find the Templo de Pechen? Robert asked. The shaman gave them directions to an outer borough of Mexico City. The two took a riverboat. The famous island of dolls were there. The miniature mannequins hung in the trees. Their burnt plastic bodies were beneath a wooden sign. Spray-painted words designated the area as off-limits. The jump cut in the film occurred. They stood at the mouth of a cave. A scream erupted. It was Victoria's. 
A gun's muzzle showed up on the right-hand side of the camera view in a black-gloved hand wrapped around Robert's throat. The camera fell to the ground and the screen went black. Card clicked again. A photograph of a large mansion made of clay surrounded by fertile green land came up. This is our target, Card said. We infiltrate, take out any threats, and question for more info. Baccarin's group resides here when they're not taking hostages or invading villages. Someone inside knows Victoria's location. We can be there by tomorrow. Let's eat, drink, and rest tonight. We save her life after sunup. Two million dollars each if you bring Victoria back alive, LaSalle said. The chopper you'll be traveling in has anti-radar. A picture of Victoria LaSalle came up on the screen. She was 22 years old. I looked at the image of the young woman. I thought of her callow world view. Her inherent trust of people in the online gold rush of fame led to her kidnapping. I still believe that the situation she was in was undeserving. Despite how much I disliked the way Card drafted me, I felt I still had to help. If it was only in remembrance of the girl's spirit by exacting revenge, it would be worth it. We leave tomorrow morning, Card said. Your lodging for the night is down the hall. What kind of gear are we getting? Morales asked. You see? We left the boardroom. I know the Devorador de Almos, Morales said. We walked down a hallway with windows which overlooked a golf course. Morales looked straight ahead. His eyes seemed to peer on into forever before he continued. She has killed some of my family. I can't wait to squeeze life out of her. Stepping onto the four-bladed, navy-style Black Hawk chopper made me feel at home. It sat on a black and yellow painted helipad built onto a piece of land owned by LaSalle. The smell of sweat and exhaust bombarded us when we went into the chopper. The pilot ignored us and focused on the controls of the dashboard. My boots landed on the floor's ringlets and pipes locked for stretchers and extra seats. I buckled up. The open back cargo area held our weaponry. We were all carrying SP-45 tactical handguns with threaded barrels and suppressors. Our primary weapon of choice was the EM-14 SOCOM or AK-47 T as in the incident of a firefight we would be able to reload by stripping the combatants' bodies of ammunition. It was the same as what the cartel carried. Our body armor was Class Three, a plates made of carbon fiber. Bofang radios were on our belts alongside our holsters. We carried four grenades each. I had a World War II era K-bar. Some of the others carried SOG seal pup blades and bench-made knives, in the back of the chopper were six old Soviet rocket-propelled grenade launchers. There were also mounts, multi-tools, and attachable advanced optical combat gun sights. A COGS. I donned bracers which kept my blades secure and within easy reach, beneath the long sleeves of my top. It took less than a minute for the Black Hawk to enter the air. The planes below were specks. The houses resembled motionless ants. Some of us were still assembling our guns as we drifted in the atmosphere. We're going to scout the mansion, Card said. We do recon after stalking the premises. If we find the target, we take her in for questioning. Remember? How this is a rescue mission. We neutralize threats only when left with no other choice. I looked over at Morales. He pulled out a keychain and stared at it. It had a scorpion frozen in a block of amber attached to the metal pieces. I kept my head down as we passed the outlines of cathedrals, colleges, and museums in Mexico City. Their earthen-tinged buildings reflected the clouds and sunlight. There were estates the size of city blocks surrounded by gates below. We kept ourselves fed with protein bars and water as we neared a stretch of land filled with rivers. The landscape resembled a labyrinth of cracked dirt a child had spilled a bucket of water over. The Black Hawk landed on a hillside facing a field of legumes and different varieties of grass. Card ordered us off, and we began running along the mound. 
we marched for half a mile before the mansion came into view. Elevated walls with marble slats formed a canopy above a terrace and swimming pool. Black-framed windows and roof gardens held verdant plant life. Wapilla shrubberies lined the outskirts of two different courtyards. One was in the front and back. Both had white and pink tiles which looked as though they had been dug out from a holy structure and brought there. Beige beams and silver railings encircled a dark wooden spiral staircase. This was visible from where we were because of the absence of glass. A statue stood next to the swimming pool. It looked like Lady Justice. Instead of scales, she held a snake in one hand and a severed head in the other. Do you know what that statue is? I asked Morales. The dope god Ola Khan, he said. She is always carried by the cartel. Get down, Card said. We laid flat on our stomachs and took cover behind a row of bushes. We peered through the sights of our sniper rifles. Card pulled out a pair of infrared binoculars. Lots of scorpions there, he said. Remember, the less engagement, the better. We'll wait here all night for Elasia if we have to. I looked out at the rear courtyard. Two men walked. One was a scorpion. His uniform was normal for the group. He had on beige khakis, a tactical overcoat, and an ache. Forty-seven. He was pointing his weapon at the second man, who was in his seventies. The old man's hands were behind his back as the scorpion prodded him along. He kicked the hostage in the back of the knees. The elder dropped, and the scorpion aimed the rifle at his head. The scorpion hit the old man with the butt of the weapon and made him squirm. I aimed at the scorpion's kill zone. I squeezed the trigger. A crimson trail floated from the hostel as he fell to the ground. Shouting flared up. Seven scorpions flooded out of the estate. Dryden picked off two of them in a matter of seconds as I shot another. Circle the perimeter, Card yelled. Moralio, stay on Lawson 6 and take the right. Dryden, take the front courtyard and stick with Hain. I'll get around to the back and start clearing the house. We don't want them calling reinforcements. We sprinted towards the mansion. A member fired shots at us as we took cover behind a marble block behind potted plants. Bullets chewed through the stone as I returned fire. Morales unsheathed his sog blade, stood up when the fire had ceased, and threw it. The knife landed in the enemy's eyes. His body tumbled back as he continued to unleash a spray of lead everywhere. The back of his skull cracked open with the impact of the fall. Advance! Morales shouted. We moved further up to an overhang supported by clay beams. A member fired shots at us from the inside. Morales was thrust backwards in the air. I squeezed the trigger at the opening. I whipped around and scanned the area for advancing movements. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine, Morales said while standing up. The bullet must have hurt, but his vest protected him. We trailed along the western side of the house. We glanced around the corner to see Hain evade a chucked Molotov before it burst. Hain shot the man who had tried to kill him. The smell of fuel was pungent in the air as his combatant's lifeless form buckled. Hain kicked in the door and entered the place. We followed behind him, our guns at the ready. The main foyer had a large spiral staircase in an open area which resembled a hotel lobby. Three waited for us. Hain's armor got hit as he executed the first attacker. Morales took out the secondary. The third unloaded a round at us as I shot him in the arm. His gun dropped and he fell to the tile. He unsheathed the hatchet, stood up, and ran towards me with a wail. I gave him two rounds to the neck before he went limp in face. Planted. Card's voice rang out. Grenade! We went to the ground and covered our ears. An explosion rocked the eastern side of the mansion. Debris showered us. We concealed our faces from the cloud of destruction as best we could. Card came down from the blitz staircase, dragging two bodies with him. He threw them down to our level as he leapt over the railing. Dust and gore blanketed him. Take what they have and reload, he said. It's clear from the bottom up. We have the basement left to search. Go. Our commander pointed at an oak wooden door swung open in the far left corner. 
I was in the front of the group. I turned on the flashlight attached to my scope. I descended a rickety old staircase to the subterranean part of the narco mansion. Card was closest to my side, with the others following. We entered a Baroque-style wine cellar. Copper plates hung on the walls, shelves with carved drawings on their oak-held long rows of bottles. A scorpion jumped out from behind a wood barrel. I grabbed his arm and broke his wrist and slammed my hand into his solar plexus. He doubled over and I gave him a knee to the face. I grabbed the back of his head, swept his feet out from under him, and placed him in a rear naked choke. Card tapped me on the shoulder. Don't kill him, he said. Let him go. He might have some answers we need. He's the only one left alive. I released him and stood up. Cardhead Morales translated his questions into Spanish. Where is the soul Deverer? Where is Victoria LaSalle? The scorpion spat on Card. Card pulled out his handgun and shot the man in the left knee. Tell him that he'll be wheelchair-bound for the rest of his life unless he starts talking, Card said to Morales. The man began crying as Morales repeated the words. He says that there is a map leading to where they are, Morales said. The Templo de Pusian. It's in the head of the Olacon statue near the pool. Retrieve it, Card said after facing me. Dryden, you go with him. I went up the basement steps and out towards the pool. I passed piles of bodies. At least twenty scorpions lay dead. A fire was burning the ground on the other side of the mansion from the throne Molotov. The old man, who was a former hostage of the first scorpion I shot at, was lying down, bleeding but alive. I cut the restraints binding his wrists. I gave him admire and advised him to go home. He thanked me and went into the desert. I approached the Olacon statue. I drove my cow bar into the head she held. I slipped my black gloves on. I dug my fingers into the hollow interior and pulled out a thick piece of brown parchment covered in grime. Morales stared at the map after Card grabbed it. He unfolded it on the surface of a table in the cellar. We let the scorpion go after Dryden administered aid to him in the form of a tourniquet. We gave him a fractured beam to use as a walking stick. I helped him up the stairs and brought him to the edge of the property. We made sure he did not have a cell phone or radio. I wished him good luck as he hobbled away. I knew the environment, coupled with the severity of his injuries, was going to take his life. This does point to the Templar. De Putin, Morales said. That can't be right. The temple is a myth. It's a place destroyed during a war between rival Mayan kingdoms in the 5th century. We're about to see if it's real or not, I said. I reloaded my I-47. We sat in the back of the Black Hawk, flying through the air in a direction using the map's coordinates. Morales took off his vest and revealed bruising around his ribs. I gave him my vest since his gut damaged. I went into the back and retrieved a new one. Your tattoo, Morales said. Who wrote it? Ambrose Bierce, I said. It's the definition of a saint from his book, The Devil's Dictionary. What does it do for you? It reminds me how nobody's perfect. Keeps me from self-loathing. Thanks for what you did back there, Morales said. What you did back there was hot-headed, Card said. Good job to the rest of the team for dealing with a jarhead's mistake. I took the criticism aware the firefight started with me trying to do the fair thing in saving an old man's life. Straight on, the pilot shouted. We stared. It can't be, Morales said. A moss-covered pyramid made of old stones came into view on the horizon. It was the ancient building seen in countless historic drawings. I thought of human sacrifices painted blue and brought to the top. My mind could not escape the image of their hearts eaten by a predatory god. The sun lowered. The black hawk landed on a neighboring hill covered in grass. We jumped out and took position on a precipice. We crouched and stared through our sights and night vision binoculars. Oh my god, Dryden said as he squinted through his eye cog. Are you seeing this? 
There was a campfire, tents and bodies in the distance. The corpses looked starved. They in rows as if they were about to be burnt or buried. They all wore the scorpion uniform. A figure walked past them. I recognized her. I've found Elysia, I said. We take her alive, Card said as he pulled out the same tranquilizer gun he had used on me a day and a half ago. She knows where Victoria is. Is anyone else with her? The dead, Dryden said. We're heading in, Card said. Maintain concealment. We approached the pyramid. The sounds of rattling snakes and the smell of rotting flesh wafted towards us with each step. We crouched low in the bushes within fifteen feet of the soul devourer. A hatchet flew by my head, a net wrapped around my body. Card pulled out his gun and fired. A masked scorpion ran near me, and while I wanted to shoot, the net constricted my body and I could not lift. My weapon, he hit me upside the head with the butt of his arc. I lost consciousness. I woke up. Everything came into focus like an image in a microscope. I heard arguing in Spanish. Looking over with my wrists tied in vines, I saw Morales hung upside down from a palm tree. Right by his side were Dryden and Card Bound in the same way. Most of our gear was gone. I felt my knives were still intact, but there was no way of using them. Alicia smiled at us as a campfire's flames roared behind her. Next to Elysia was a folded-out briefcase lined with hacksaws, rods, pliers, and needles. Where is Victoria? I yelled at her. The soul devourer laughed and walked towards me. She reached out and grabbed my jaw. She leaned in close enough to kiss me. They're inside, she said, pointing to the mouth of the pyramid. See all those bodies? She gestured to the men drained of blood. Olesha pulled what looked like the front of a human skull with two bands near the back. It resembled a diode Los Murtos fashion item. Leathery snake skin wrapped around the bone matter. Victoria's lover is the one responsible for this, Alicia said. We didn't kill him for sport. We did it for vengeance. Do you even know what the Puchins are, gringo? Shapeshifters, creatures able to take different forms. The boy wandered around the temple one night when we fell asleep after he tried to escape. He found the mask, one we knew as sacred, but his ignorance cost him and us everything. He decided to put it on and he resurrected them. Victoria is about to become a feast for the Puchins. My men were as well after her foolish boyfriend fell victim to his own curiosity. You're soon to be also. Arizona Paratonta, Morale said. Pinchy Piro, she said after walking toward him. You'll be the first one I torture. Morales brought his hands down. A knife slid from one of his bracers. He cut the vines which imprisoned him. He dug the knife into Alicia's forehead. She slumped to the earth. He bent upwards and cut the bindings on his feet before landing on his back. The same guard who had knocked me out unleashed a spurt of bullets at the escaped ranger who pivoted to the side. Morales grabbed a Beretta off Elysia's belt and ended the scorpion's life with a shot to the chest. He cut the rest of his team members down from the bindings. Card had a black eye, Dryden had a scrape on his forehead, and Hain looked exhausted. We retrieved our gear from their tents and put on our combat attire again. You heard her, Card said as he motioned to the mouth of the pyramid. Victoria's in there. Let's go. What about the Puchins? Dryden asked. You know, the shapeshifters brought back to life. You believe in old wives' tales? Card asked. Alicia was trying to scare us. Dryden stared at the seal. I don't see how these men could have had blood removed from their bodies, sir. It doesn't add up. Not our problem, Card said. Focus on the goal at hand. We've all seen worse, and you know it. Let's go in. Dryden nodded, and we went into the temple. There was a long corridor with a floor made of stone blocks. The first few walls were heaps of ancient mortar. Once we were in a larger area with hung torches, which lit the way, we walked on hollow ground. 
The Mayan interior had stucco friezes. Depictions of human figures lined the barriers. They had elaborate bird headdresses, jade jewels, and each one sat cross-legged. Ceramic vessels were on the shelves against the walls. Decks of goddesses with snakeheads and other deified rulers of an age long gone greeted us. We went into another chamber. A wooden funerary mask with emerald beaded teeth hung in the center and gazed down at us in warning. In the next hall there were holes in the ceiling. Fluorescence from the moon and stars pierced through them as beams. Obelisks lined up like an Aztec stone hinge. Victoria was in the middle of the room. She wore a white top and black cargo pants given to her by the cartel caked in blood. She was staring at the ceiling and looked at me as I approached. She was bound to one of the pillars. I cut the ropes. Your father sent us to save you, Card said. They, she said. Who's they, Morales asked. They're coming for us. The sound of hissing filled the room. Something moved to my left. When I turned with my gun aimed, I saw Dryden lifted off his feet and carried towards the ceiling. His form floated through the beams of light. He screamed, released a few shots, and vanished. The remaining four of us pointed our guns up. Dryden fell back down to the ground. He was pale, thin, and devoid of blood, like the men who were out front. His breathing had ceased. The thing swooped down. It was a serpent the size of a battering ram used to tear down doors on medieval castles. Two black leather wings outstretched on either side. The wings had sharp tips laced. Through it, like sticks, used to hold a kite together. Card pulled out his knife and slashed at the monster. The stringy and fibrous gliding implements tore. Blood spurted from it onto his clothes. Hain came up from behind and tried to climb onto its back, but its body was too slick. I ran up to Hain. I climbed onto his shoulders and leapt onto the creature's back. I yelled out a battle cry and emptied a clip into the Puchin's head after pointing the gun straight down. It fell forward like a slinky. I landed on my side and slid from its flesh. Card grabbed Victoria's hand and ran towards the entrance, way after motioning for us to do the same. We followed at a sprint. One of the beasts slithered out of the shadows as fast as a vehicle, going full speed. Its body writhed with serpentine movements towards us. Its wings folded onto its form with tightening muscles. Its body locked up to spring at us as grotesque noises echoed in the chamber. Card pulled a pin on his grenade and threw it into the creature's mouth. It exploded in a cloud of entrails as we continued running. Another Puchin followed behind it. As the third one neared us, it began to change its own form, mutating. I was not eager to find out what shape it would take next. I lobbed a grenade behind me as we went outside. The creature's head made it to the threshold of the mouth of the pyramid. Morales turned around and began shooting at the eyes. The creature's tongue lashed out and hit him in the knees, and its gaze burrowed into him. Morales' gun dropped as his body froze and began seeping out blood in front of me. The red fluid soaked into the earth and gushed towards the fangs of the monster. I lobbed more grenades until my belt was empty. I reached for Morales' belt and retrieved his keychain and another bomb. I threw it at the Puchin. We ran over the row of dead scorpions. Victoria tripped over Elise's body. I helped pick her up and we continued to run. The base of the pyramid was the first to get wiped out by the blasts. The rest fell as if a hurricane had wreaked havoc. The stones tumbled down onto the creature's body, halting its advance. Morales got buried with it in a maelstrom of fragmented rock. We ran up the hill and jumped into the Black Hawk. It was two minutes before Victoria was secure in a chair, and we lifted off the ground. As we ascended, I looked down and saw more slithering forms. I wish I could go back and retrieve Morales and Dryden to give them the proper burials they deserve. I grabbed an RPG from the back, leveled it, took in a deep breath, and fired a missile at both of the snakes. The targets evaporated in flames. The palm trees, bodies, and blocks of granite became engulfed in an inferno below. 
The blaze and debris rose as an angry storm before it all collapsed back down. The mission was successful, Card said. We did it. Good job, men. We remained silent for hours after as the desert landscape passed beneath us. The keychain Morales had kept stared back at me, the scorpion frozen in amber. I decided to pocket it as a keepsake, a remembrance of the man who served by my side. We were soon over the border and back into the United States. My dad sent you, Victoria asked. We all nodded. Alesia told me my father's been funding money for rival cartels in this region, Victoria said. She stared out at the night sky before she continued. He's involved in arms deals down here for terrible people. He always told me his money came from oil. He lied. He didn't take me hostage with the hopes of making money. They did it to torment him. None of us said a word. Victoria reached into one of the side pockets of her cargo pants and pulled out the Mayan skull mask, the very object which had caused the rift between what we recognized as real and the unknown, the item which had allowed those beasts to escape from their world of sleep, their nests. This made me feel alive when I was wearing it, Victoria said. It made Lucas feel amazing, too. It brings out a sense of godliness. Have the three of you ever felt anything like that? I pulled out my forty-five and shot the mask. A fog filled the inside of the chopper, emanating from the remaining pieces which rained down on us. I kicked what landed on the ground out of the compartment to the nether sand. Howard LaSalle's mansion came into view as Victoria screamed at us. I went for a drive back in the spring of 1995 with three kids, my daughters and one of their cousins. It was starting to get dark and I decided I wanted to turn around. Without going all the way down a somewhat secluded road, I pulled into a turnaround with the car lights on. In the bushes on the other side of the road I noticed some movement. I initially thought it might have been a deer, so I stopped the car completely. The first thing I really saw were bright blue eyes, and then I noticed how high up they were. The creature had to be about eight to nine feet tall, and the rest of it was very dark, possibly black or dark brown. My daughter saw its feet, which were huge. When I realized it might be a Bigfoot, I freaked out and quickly left the area. I've never gone down there after dark again, and I rarely go there at all. The creature didn't move after the initial movement we saw. It just stood there looking at us. There are local legends about a wild man in the woods, and recently there have been a rash of sightings. Some of them are quite close to town, and the people who claim to have seen it are quite believable, with their stories being quite convincing. My encounter took place back in 1970. We had always heard rumors of a large dog roaming the area of Bowers Road, killing pigs and sheep, but we never for a moment thought it was something like the dogman. We hadn't heard of the dogman or the beast of Bray Road until ten years after we moved to Waterford. Anyway, one late summer evening in 1970, my brother and I were fooling around in the hayloft. We opened the door that they used when filling the barn with an elevator. We were playing for about an hour when my brother and I noticed something black in the hayfield, far off in the distance, to the point where we couldn't make out what it was. Well, my brother had a whistle he got from a box of Cracker Jacks. He took that whistle and blew it as hard as he could. When he did, whatever that thing was, it stood up and started walking towards the barn. We couldn't tell what it was, but it scared us, and we fled from the barn, running to the house. We told our dad what we had seen, and he investigated it, but found nothing. We couldn't believe that it could just disappear like that. My brother and I were convinced that whatever it was, it was in the barn, waiting for us. It was probably a month before we went back in, and that was only because the farmer who owned the barn would show up from time to time to house his pigs when they were giving birth. So we knew there was nothing hiding in there. 
We never found out what we saw walking on two legs towards the barn that day, and we never saw it again. We moved to Waterford in 1973, and it was ten years before we even heard about the Beast of Bray Road. My brother and I talked about it later in life and figured perhaps it was. I listened to your glitches in the Matrix video last night. I've had two experiences, both on the NYC subway. The first time was about five years ago. I was riding on the subway train, and I noticed that one of my fellow passengers was a near-perfect dead ringer for one of my friends. Yet the same face shape, the same exact hair color, and was about the same shape body-wise. However, he appeared to be about 10 or 12 years older than my friend, and he, he had a beard on his chin and was wearing a beret and black sunglasses. He also didn't recognize me, further proof that they were not the same person. However, I swear that they looked nearly identical, so much so that I was quite shaken at the time. The second event took place only about a week ago. I was riding downtown with my brother when I took note of a young woman sitting across from me. She was pretty, so I took a few opportunities to notice her and got a fairly good idea of what she looked like. She got off the train just before it was about to go express. I didn't think anything else of it at the time. However, about ten minutes later, on the other end of the express pass, both my brother and I got out of the train. As we were walking up the steps to the upper platform, I noticed the same girl coming down the step street towards us. She walked past us and walked down the stairs. It is possible that she got off of our train and got onto another one for a seating view of the express path to the upper platform. If this is the case, she was obviously lost because it was such a huge waste of her time when she could just stay on the train. However, it's the most reasonable explanation I can think of. While I was listening to you, a memory popped into my head from about 25 years ago. I can't remember what time of year it was, but it was dark, so it had to be late summer or early fall because there was, there was no snow and the trees hadn't started turning yet. I was driving to Edmonton, Alberta one night, and I was coming to the Hangingston River. I had just passed the Department of Highways yard and was parallel to the Hangingston campground when I noticed two bright reflections on the other side of the river on the slope of the hill near the top. This grabbed my attention at the time because I had driven that highway for years and couldn't remember seeing reflectors in that spot before. As I crested the hill on the north side of the river heading down to the bridge, I was still looking at the reflectors when I realized that it was eye shine because I could see the silhouette of some kind of an animal. The eyes were huge, as I mentioned above. I thought they were reflectors of some sort. I never took my eyes off this thing. It was dimly lit by my headlights, and it was about halfway between the road and, and the tree line. As I was driving past this thing, I could see the shape of it, and what it looked like to me was a giant doe, or a cow moose, because there were not. Antlers. It was sitting on its haunches like a dog would. It never shifted its gaze. It just sat there staring across the river. I was looking at it in profile as I passed. The first thing that crossed my mind was the sheer size of it, so I, I figured it must have been a really big cow moose. Then it struck me how odd it was for a moose to be sitting on its haunches like that because it looked just like an enormous dog. Then the goosebumps hit me and I put the pedal to the metal and sped away. But as I did, that I was thinking of how silly I was to be afraid of a moose sitting like a puppy. I can still picture in my mind's eye, just sitting there, staring off across the river. It looked like a giant dog, but my mind wouldn't let me process that. So it was a big cow moose at that point in my life. I was curious about the Sasquatch, and I had never heard of the dogman, so neither of those things was even on my radar at that moment. Every time I've told that story, I've always said it was a moose. So, for your video to trigger that memory so vividly, I believe that I have been wrong all these years about what I saw that night, and I believe that I do know 
now what it actually was. It was 2017 when it was winter. I live in British Columbia along the coast. I think there was a bit of snow on the ground and the sun had just set, so it was not completely dark out yet, but not light either. My sister and her boyfriend and me and my boyfriend were in our backyard. I think we just went outside briefly to run around in the snow, since where we live, it's actually a rare occurrence. My sister all of a sudden freezes and says she sees something or someone behind a tree. She then walks over to it and she sees it disappear. Freaked out, she wanted to go back inside, so we all went with her. When inside, she told us what she saw was a large black-winged creature sitting behind a tree looking in our direction. Apparently, it was sitting with its wings down, covering its body kind of hunched. Then when she got closer, she saw it turn the other way, covering its face with its wings so it wasn't facing her anymore. It moved further away behind the tree, and once she was close enough to see it, it was gone. None of us believed her. We all told her it was probably just a raven or a herring, a shadow, but she was sure she saw something huge with wings. We let it go, but she was clearly freaked out. Fast forward to the next Saturday. My boyfriend and I, my sister and her boyfriend, same people as before, were all in my bedroom, which is the master bedroom of the house, and we have these French doors that open up onto the sun deck and look out into our backyard. We were just about to smoke some weed together when my boyfriend opened the door to the sun deck and looked up past our backyard to see this massive bird leave a branch in a tree. He said, holy is that eagle is huge. I looked up just in time to see it leave the branch and fly for light two seconds before it disappeared behind more trees, but it was bigger than an eagle for sure. It wasn't in a tree in our backyard, but we have this embankment that goes up to these apartments that are next to us, and the tree we saw the thing fly off was up there. So it wasn't really clear, but we have eagles around us often, and I have never seen one that size. It looked like its wingspan was 14 feet long, almost. It was completely black. My sister and her boyfriend just missed it, but they saw the tree branch. It came off still bouncing up and down from it, jumping off. I said it looked like a human with wings, and my sister freaked out and reminded us of the time she saw that thing in the backyard. All of us had forgotten about it until she told us about it again. Now I actually believe her. My boyfriend said it looked like a human with wings, but he doesn't believe in stuff like that. Plus, on top of this, we had a dog who passed away in January, but she would sleep on the sun deck if it was warm enough for her. And often, we could hear her growling at something in the backyard and pacing back and forth. Could have been a deer in the backyard or raccoon. But my dog was uninterested in deer in her old age, and raccoons used to come on our deck all the time, and we would hear them. But this time it was different. I've hunted quite a bit when I was in my 20s, not so much now. The one that really stands out was when I was walking through unfamiliar woods, and I just got the feeling something was watching me. Like something was hunting me and not the other way around. I never saw anything. No tracks, no tufts of fur, nothing to suspect an animal was hunting me, but I just couldn't shake the feeling. Only time I've ever been out in woods and got that uneasy. Since June 2017, I've been witnessing something peculiar at night whenever I step out into my yard. At first, I had no idea what it was, but I could clearly see large yellow eye shine, approximately three feet off the ground. When I spot this being, I get an intense fight, or flight feeling. I remember telling the being, I'm not afraid of you, so don't mess with me. On that particular night, my neighbor also saw the being in the darkness. As I approached it, the being backed away. It was a remarkable sight. This tall figure, with no growling or aggression, just calmly watching me. I went inside briefly to grab my knife, 
but when I returned, the being had disappeared. My neighbor, who had previously heard heavy breathing while walking the Ice Age trail with his wife, couldn't see anything. However, he distinctly heard the sound of something with long nails walking on the pavement, and even a hyena, like laughter coming from the being. He saw five sets of eye shine, four pairs of yellow, and one pair of red. The eye shine was above his head, and he's five feet eleven inches tall, so those beings had to be at least six point five to seven feet in height. The howl we heard resembled the dogman howl on the Nod website. On another occasion, my neighbor was taking out the trash before work around 2 a.m. In the lights of his truck, he saw something in front of it, a creature that he described as a wolf on steroids. It was incredibly muscular, and its head reached my neighbor's chest when it was on all fours. He said it looked like a bodybuilder, stared at him, and let out a yip before he left. About a week later, I was taking my dogs out of their backyard kennels and bringing them into the house. As I let my bulldog inside, I saw two yellow shining eyes in my yard, about 40 feet away. I calmly addressed the being. I don't care if you are here, but don't mess with my family or my dogs. I then went inside with my other dog. At approximately 3 a.m., we were awakened by loud animal noises, a strange mix of a whistle a scream, and a hum all at the same time, with what seemed like infrasound involved. Around two weeks ago, my neighbor and I spotted the being at about 8.30 p.m., and it was still light out. After a bonfire, my neighbor poured water on the embers, causing them to smoke and sizzle. The startling noise prompted the being to rise from the tall grass on two legs. It was an incredible sight, with large muscles but a skinny waist. It had human-like shoulders, but they were exaggerated and massive. The quads were thick, and the legs got skinnier from the knees down. It had pointed ears, a wolfish appearance, and a bushy wolf-like tail. Its fur was black with two white stripes starting at the ears and running down to the chest. It watched us from the tall grass before running toward the woods on all fours and then on two legs and back to four. I even grabbed a spotlight and headed toward the trail the being had taken. However, due to the ditches on either side of the trail, I decided to return, believing that the being was merely curious and not a threat to us. I don't think the being is around right now, and I suspect it was merely curious rather than stalking or threatening us. It was January of 2003 in Baxter County, Arkansas, and we were near the intersection of Highway 62 and 101. The time was around 2 or 3 in the morning, and it was a cold, clear winter night. I was coming home from fishing, and as we rounded the 30-mile and hour curve just before the stop sign, we were headed south on 101. That's when we saw something unusual. An animal walking upright came into clear view as he was illuminated by my high beams. He was on the west, side shoulder. My buddy Joe, who was with me, and I didn't exchange a word. We were now driving at maybe 20 miles an hour as we watched this massive creature standing upright, taking one step. He went from the far side of the shoulder to the center line, where he paused for a moment and looked us up and down. Although we didn't feel any fear, Joe and I both had the sense that he was looking at each one of us, starting with me and then turning his gaze toward Joe. After that, he turned his head straight and leaned forward, putting his knuckles on the pavement. He swung his hips through his arms and was now on the far side of the east shoulder, disappearing into the night. It was gun deer season in northern Wisconsin. I was sitting in an open tree stand that was relatively low to the ground. In front of me, to my left, was dense shrubbery, and to my right there was an opening before the wood started. All of a sudden I heard some rustling in the bushes to the left. Two little fluff balls came tumbling out into the open area. Initially I had no idea what they were. I was intently focused on them, trying to figure out what animal this was. Then I heard the deepest and scariest growling coming from behind me. I immediately froze. 
Next thing I knew, I had a mother bobcat circling my tree. It might have only been a minute or two, but it felt like an eternity. She continued circling the tree, growling at me and never taking her gaze off of me. Finally, the cubs decided they were done playing and everyone moved on. I will never forget the sound of that growl and the intensity of the bobcat's eyes staring at me. After I came back in, I told this story to my dad. He seemed rather excited, saying that he hasn't seen any wild bobcats in the area yet. However, I did not feel so lucky about the encounter at the time. This incident happened around 11 p.m. at night. My daughter was home alone as she lives with a relative who was out of town. She called me at 11, 22, and she was terrified. She mentioned hearing something walking back and forth by her bedroom window. She also said she looked out the window when she first heard it and saw something big and black, really massive. She described the thing as being about three to four feet above the bottom of the window. When I went down to look behind the house the following morning, I stood by the window. I am five foot four, and my eyes just reached the bottom of the window. So I figure this thing must have been seven to eight feet tall. We live in a small village of fewer than 500 people, and there are a lot of bushes and trees between the houses. Their house is close to the beach, and there's a forest surrounding the town. Now, I've never known my daughter to be afraid of anything. But last night, when I went to pick her up, she was shaking like a leaf and hysterical. It took me almost an hour to calm her down. I questioned her about what happened, and she called me about five minutes after she first saw it. She was too scared to move when I got down there. I would not look behind the house, but she was hiding in my relative's closet. She said it was walking back and forth right behind the house describing the footsteps as sounding like someone very large walking on two feet, kind of like a stomping. My daughter is usually very down-to-earth and not prone to dramatics. When I first went down there, I didn't really know what was going on, just that my daughter was extremely scared. But when I went up to the house, my hair felt like it was standing on end, and I had goosebumps really bad. I was scared, and I didn't know why. There are quite a few other stories about sightings close to town, and one was less than a mile away. Additionally, there have been other sightings on a nearby road by several people. In fact, there are probably too many for me to tell about. I go walking in the woods near my place, and three terrifying things have happened, and every single one was in the same section of trail. The first was one of the earliest times I went walking. I wasn't entirely sure of my timing to get to the opposite end of the woods and back, and I ended up walking two-thirds of the way back in the dark. I had a flashlight, which I could use part of the time, but wasn't able to leave on. I would flash it on, set my course, and walk until I felt I needed to check again. I'm walking through the pitch dark, and I hear something about 50 yards back scream. It scared the shit out of me. I picked up my pace a bit when suddenly whatever it was screamed again. About 15 feet away at my 11 o'clock, I hadn't heard anything move and I booked it. I leaned later that it may have been foxes, but I never went walking out there again without a means of self-defense. The second time was in late afternoon walk. Same spot on the trail I was walking and it was almost Disney-like. Birds singing, bugs chirping, squirrels. Squirreling. There was a small breeze, and it was lovely out. Suddenly, at the exact same time, the wind stopped, the sun dropped behind a cloud, and every single animal stopped doing anything. The entire woods went completely still and silent. I had never understood deafening silence until that moment. I tensed up and kept moving, and about ten seconds later, sound returned and everything went back to normal. I took the same way back, and it didn't happen again. The third time was about a month later. I was walking down that way, and I was looking about a little more, as this time I was out at midday, and it was as bright as deep woods get. I noticed something off the trail and went to look at it. I found a deer trail that I could follow and realized that the high grass hid a deep ditch off the trail that the river cut out during flooding. 
It had been dry, so I dropped into it. I'm a big dude at about 6.5 feet tall, and the edge of this ditch was at my eye level and probably about 10 feet across. I decided to follow it and come out at the river and then work my way down the bank until I hit the trail again. I walked about 20, 5 feet and had to work over a tree that had collapsed into the ditch at a curve in its path. I came to the other side and froze. There was deer everywhere. Not plural deer, a single deer spread over the entirety of the ditch. The ribs were closest, the skull was across the ditch from them, and all the other bones were scattered about like it had hit a landmine. There was a definite stench to the area, and the bones were dry, but still had sinew strong about them, in spots. It took me all of about three seconds to realize that I was standing in something's dining room. I backed up to the tree, used it as my point of egress from the ditch, and ignoring the voice in my head saying not to bust straight through the underbrush to the path, busted straight through the underbrush to the path. I came out at, you guessed it, that creepy spot on the woods trail. I walked swiftly to a different trail and walked through the open field to get home. I don't know precisely what lives in that section of the woods, but it always freaks me out to see parents taking their toddlers out there to walk. It's a curvy path up to that section, which is a straightaway with flat ground and the underbrush making a well-defined path. I know people let their kids run up and down it since they can see all the way to end and the kids have the ability to run freely without being out of sight. I know it's probably not going to happen, but I always mentally see a kid running away from his parents down the path, a rustle of brush, a flash of fur, and the sound of little Billy being carried off into the woods. My next encounter with a possible dogman was in December 2016. I own my own business. And outside the building, I found a trail of huge prints, each marked with two claw marks in a single file trail. I investigated the prints, took pictures, and cast the best one. I've had other strange experiences as well. I've heard knocking on the side of the building and noises banging around upstairs. I've seen a large wolf, and there are no wolves in southern Wisconsin, sitting in the parking lot next door, watching my window. I've also witnessed UFOs across the highway in the cornfields and orbs around my building. One late night, a UFO came towards me, and I heard a loud metallic voice say my name and order me to do something, although I can't recall what. I then experienced missing time when I was texting a co-worker repeatedly, and we both ended up in the parking lot three hours later, not knowing how she got there. I believe I have an implant in my chest, and when I showed it to someone, they confirmed it. It's about an inch long and half an inch wide, just under the skin on my chest. My co-worker also has an implant that we believe is related to our experiences. She remembers the graves that took us and has seen them before in my parking lot. She knows what they sound like and has also seen the wolf run across the road in front of her one night on her way home. I believe my experiences entirely. I've known myself for years now, and my sons also know me. My case makes me wonder if, as MUFON believes, the dogman is a screen for the greys. In my case, I could believe that. I've been targeted and am afraid to speak out because I believe that when I do, bad things happen to me and my family. I've also taken pictures of the UFO getting closer and closer to my business and orbs in several pictures. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.